So hi everybody who's joined. Um, very happy to have you with us today. Um, so uh, just as a bit of introduction, good afternoon and good evening wherever you are based and signing in from. Uh, my name is Sanjana. I'm one of the founders of uh, Miara along with Gayatri who's also on this call. So first of all, I'll tell you what is, what is Miara. So Miara is an online health platform um, which is meant for women in midlife and help them through this transitional period to midlife and beyond midlife. And uh, what we do is we offer um, support in terms of products, services, um, as well as connection to expert. And so we're very happy to have um, Saumya with us today. So um, just as a little bit of introduction to Saumya, Saumya is a registered dietitian uh, with the Indian Dietic Society uh, Association. She is a passionate believer in the power of real foods. Her philosophy revolves around balance as well as moderation. Um, she is a clinical turned holistic dietitian with a rich experience of over 15 years dealing with management of uh, lifestyle disorders. And I think Saumya's aim is really to spread the wisdom of nutrition science for healthy living. So hi, Saumya. Happy to have you with here with us. Yeah, hi, Sanjana. So super excited to be on your platform today. Yeah, And so uh, it's a coincidence that it happens to be the National Nutrition Week as well. So this is a good opportunity to spread the message across to the audience as well. Thank right. you so much. Your, uh, no, it's our pleasure. And I just wanted to set the context for what we're talking about. So today we're talking about uh, midlife nutrition. And why is this so important? Because there are a lot of changes that a woman undergoes during midlife. There are different symptoms. And one of the main things that people say is there's a bit of weight gain, muscle loss. So a lot, a lot of things which can be improved with nutrition. So this is why we wanted to have this conversation. And that's why we, we're here today. So uh, just to start off, Saumya, um, so talking about midlife nutrition um, as uh, in general, what should a woman in midlife add to her diet? Okay. So Sanjana, so before I jump on to the dietary part, I would like to stress upon the three guiding principles which are mostly neglected by people. And we as practitioners also don't emphasize that in the initial phase. So for any diet plan or for any reversal of disorder or disease, these three guiding principles will always serve as a yardstick for you. Mm -hmm. So amongst those, the number one is your, uh, what do you call, hydration. So the adequacy of water, because as we are all aware, 60 to 70% of our body is made up of water. Mm -hmm. So the blood, which is 99% water, is the main carrier of your nutrients across your body. So if you are deficient in water, if you are inadequate in your water intake every day, definitely it is going to hamper your nutrient uptake by the cells. Mm -hmm. So that is very much important. And we ladies tend to neglect on this part, fearing, I don't know. So many of you might agree going to the loo, going to the washroom. So we tend to restrict uh, having water adequately during certain points of time. So this is one thing which you need to focus on. Second is your breathing techniques. Mm -hmm. So as we know, carbon dioxide is a metabolite or a waste product of our food metabolism, food combustion. Mm -hmm. So unless and until you practice your breathing properly, the waste product is not going to go out of your body, no matter how good your food is. So the waste products, unless and until it doesn't go out of your body, it is not going to serve you the purpose in the long run. And third is the movement. So by movement, I mean to say not only your exercise, but how active you are throughout your day. So the more you are active, so the more active will be your body. So these are the three main guiding principles which will serve you before you start off any of your diet plan or reversal of your disorder or disease. So please keep these three things in mind before you start off anything. Mm -hmm. so coming back to your uh, question of midlife uh, nutrition of women. So 
so this is the stage when women tend to neglect their health because of various uh, uh, what you call obligation from the family professional life everything comes at a time so she is in a uh, confused state as to what to prioritize mm-hmm. so why you need to prioritize your health at this point of time because this is the age when the body starts to deteriorate in the sense what the body what you have at the age of 20 25 years tends to decline in terms of losing muscle so okay. this is the age when you have to strictly start looking at your dietary part so the key nutrients which are very important at this point of life is your calcium mm-hmm. number 2 is your vitamin d intake number 3 protein mm-hmm. and four the fibrous part So when you try to inculcate your food or diet, uh, focusing on these four nutrients, definitely you can try to revert the diseases or the disorders which are in line as you move up uh, in your uh, life. Okay. Okay. So, so that kind of brings me to the next part, which is uh, you mentioned the deficiencies, and a lot of women actually come to us with all different kinds of deficiencies that they're facing. So, should they be supplementing, or is nutrition kind of enough uh, to manage these uh, deficiencies? Yeah. So, the first and foremost, what we need to do is assess the dietary part of the client or the patient, whoever comes to us. because there are so many food rich food sources of the nutrients which are easily available around us but we are unaware of it so there is lack of awareness and second could be the convenience part not many are able to cook their food at home so it is mostly the ready to eat foods so that is causing this deficiency in many people i mean the diversification is not there actually in the diet today so supplementation becomes essential when your diet is not able to provide you the nutrients in the adequate amounts which is required by the body so it is not the first resort but if your diet is not able to meet it then supplementation becomes essential so that all your activities goes in a uh, smooth fashion and an- another question is vegetarians like if you think of the indian population a large a uh, proportion of them are vegetarians and one of the key deficiencies is vitamin b12 so how do uh, what, what are the vegetarian sources of b12 and in this case would the supplementation be necessary okay so this question is not a surprising thing to me so because being a vegetarian how much are we actually taking the intake of vegetables and fruits in our daily diet so as you may be aware vitamin b12 is something which is synthesized by our, by our gut bacteria so and then this gut bacteria develops in our body when we have diverse food from various food groups so it's not like eating one particular food for the entire lifetime you have to keep changing your food and more of seasonal foods and local foods so though we are vegetarians we are deficient in actually taking the recommended intake of uh, food stuffs in your diet so that is where we are lagging in this uh, crucial uh, nutrient so as far as the sources are concerned i would recommend going for good prebiotics so that is having adequate uh, fiber in the diet so that it leads to diversity in the gut bacteria second is your probiotics like your uh, curds and nowadays you get uh, certain uh, species specific curds as well in the market but again you need to see whether it is actually live so if bacteria is not live just taking a supplement is not going to help you in any ways so these are the two things which you need to focus really to improve your uh, vitamin b12 uptake in the body I'm glad you mentioned gut health it's very important and a lot of people don't know about it but actually coming to the questions asked by some of the people who signed up for the webinar one of the big concerns is this perimenopausal weight gain or you know in the you know lower uh, abdominal weight gain that happens in this life stage 
So somebody had asked this question, how can one control this weight gain and cravings? And how do we reduce this abdominal weight gain through food? Again, you need to understand the rationale behind this. So abdominal weight gain is basically because of the cortisol hormone, the stress hormone, what we call. So as we are like, during our middle age, because of our family, personal pressures, and as well as a hormonal imbalances that takes place inside the body, there are too many things which is happening. So what happens is the cortisol hormone goes on a, uh, what do you call, a vacation mode. It starts increasing day by day. And at that point of time, if you don't exercise, so as I said, after the age of 30 years, there is a gradual reduction in the muscle mass of the body. So if you don't exercise, so the muscles are going to go down. It is going to deteriorate. Just like our brain says, if you don't exercise it, it is going, it is going to decline your cognitive skills. So similarly, if you don't use your muscles, it is definitely going to go down. So exercise as well as stress management is very important along with controlling what you are uh, feeding to your body. So that can very well uh, control your weight gain uh, post your mid age. So these things have to be started at least by the age of 30, 35, within 35, so that the next 15 to 20 years, you are okay, you are able to balance whatever the changes the body is uh, shooting at you. Yeah, that's actually a great analogy between the brain cells and the muscles. So that's that makes sense. Uh, let's just shift gears a little bit. We also had some questions uh, regarding nutrition through the menstrual cycle, because these are women who are still uh, have a menstrual cycle, uh, who have also asked these some questions. And somebody has asked, of late, I feel weak a day or two after my menstrual um, cycle is over. What food should I take at this time? What foods should I consume at this time? Okay. So again, feeling low or fatigued after the cycle, we can consider as, it as something normal, which every woman passes through depending on the flow, number of days and all. But what I would suggest you is again, focus on what you're eating. Basically the iron rich foods, your breathing techniques, more than the diet, it is a breathing that plays a vital role in the transfer of your nutrients. So if you're shallow breathing, if you're not breathing completely, the nutrients will not go to the cells. Mm. So if you're eating well, and if it is not entering the cells, you'll feel fatigued and feeling weak. So you don't feel like doing anything. So try to focus eating good fruits, good vegetables, and try to meditate for some time so that the body comes back to its original state just as it was before the menstrual cycle. That makes sense. Um, and also a couple of people have asked, um, how do you manage diet if I have PCOS, PCOD and how to get rid of it? And I think this Sorry, is- I didn't get you. PC, I didn't yeah. get the question. So the question is how to manage your diet if you have PCOS, PCOD, and how do I get rid of it? So the first and foremost about PCOD, PCOS is the weight gain. So most of the women, they struggle with weight gain once they start uh, getting this uh, disorders. So first thing you need to manage your weight, control your symptoms, and third importantly, keep moving. Because the moment you sit, the moment you sit for long hours, so it is going to put a break on your metabolic state. So once your metabolic state is low, no matter, even if you're eating less, you're going to gain weight in the process. So the, in, in order to increase your metabolic state, you have to keep moving throughout the day and focus on eating more protein rich foods and whole grain foods. Strike off all your processed, ultra processed packet foods because those are the uh, foods which have hidden preservatives or uh, coloring agents that might affect your hormones inside the body. So though you may go through the food labels, but there are many agents which you might not be aware and which can 
uh, affect your uh, estrogen and progesterone in the body. So it's better to keep stay away from such foods till your uh, treatment is on. That makes sense. And um, I mean, the fact that you mentioned protein. So one of the questions that we got is how to balance fat percentage with high protein diet. So I'm guessing the person is already on a high protein diet. So uh, how do you balance the how much fat is needed in the diet as well? So you are saying the percentage of fat versus the protein or how increased protein can help in uh, reducing the fat? So I think what I understand is the pro person is already on a high protein diet and wants to add, I, may, I guess, healthy fats into the diet. So how much of that sh should be added as well? See, the fat percentage can vary anywhere be between 15 to 20 percent in your overall diet. So what happens is how protein intake leads to fat losses. There is something called as a thermogenesis of food. That is when you are eating the food, the body also spends energy while breaking it down. So proteins are like complex molecules. So it takes a longer time for the body to digest. So when your intake of protein is high, definitely the fat will be replaced from its original position. So that is how the fat percentage slowly goes down, provided your activity is also to that extent. Otherwise, excess protein will lead to excess fat production in the body. So anything in excess is going to turn as fat. That is the mechanism of the body. So you should not go overboard on any of the nutrients. So it has to be a proper balance depending on your goal and your life stage cycle and your age. So everything has to be taken into consideration while uh, planning your meals. So it's not just like a one-liner, eat that, eat this. So you need to look at it from 365 degree as well. Yeah, like you said, the ho holistic approach to nutrition uh, and in moderation and balance, right? So those are the key elements. Um, so we've now covered uh, some of the questions that we got from the, the different uh, people. But if anybody has a question and would like to unmute and ask or uh, uh, paste it on the chat, uh, we'd be happy. I think Samya would be happy to answer that as well. Um, otherwise, we have some more disease-focused questions we can get into. So just uh, feel free to post your question or we can um, continue our conversation. So would anybody like to unmute and ask their question? We're a small group here. So just... Yeah. Hi. I have a question. Hi, Soumya. Hi, Niara. Yeah. Hi. Go ahead. Okay. So it's been lovely so far. A lot of... Uh, great insights into nutrition in midlife um but one of the questions that i um that i have always wondered and wanted to ask is this see let's say someone who's always been uh training and always been fairly uh conscious of nutrition um the same things don't seem to work with age right so uh let's say the the woman in her 30s 40s things work and things work like magic but the same amount of nutrition and the same amount of training somehow does not work in the menopause transition and post-menopause. Um, right. So a lot of women at that stage are left wondering what is it that I'm doing differently or what is it that I have to do differently to sort of navigate through this. So at what stage does a woman need to seek uh, professional help, if any, but to sort of realign uh, things with nutrition and training to sort of have the same benefits? that she got earlier when, when she was in, um, before perimenopause, perhaps. Okay, so basically you're trying to ask like, if a lady crosses at a, crosses a certain age and she is like in a confused state as to how she can go about for the rest of the, she has already crossed that stage where she can't do much as far as her nutrition or activity is concerned, right? No, I'm saying see, someone who has got a huge training and nutrition uh, uh, history, very, very good mm -hmm. training history, very good nutrition history, somehow mm -hmm. menopause seems to change that whole dynamic. All of what you have done up to then does not seem mm -hmm. to work the minute menopause hits. 
Right. It's like a true wake up call. Like there are a bunch of different things that you can do with women who don't have the training history or don't have the nutrition history. So women who already have it, mm-hmm. what is it that they need to do differently to to get the same benefit after they hit menopause? See, basically focus on like the quantity of food what they're consuming because as we all know that the quantity what we are eating at 2025, we might not have the same thing at the age of 40, 50. So first thing is being aware of the quantity and mindfulness. So most of us, I mean, it's a general phenomena to say that I've been eating this much, so I'll be eating this much only. So that is not how the body uh, reacts. So as you age, I mean, uh, as I told uh, in the previous, uh, this one as well. So as you age, the muscle percentage is going to go down. So irrespective of your exercise and your uh, diet. So that is something which comes with natural aging. So what I would recommend is try to uh, focus on your quantity part as to actually how diverse is your diet, whether you are actually eating everything as per the recommendation, because we might be eating a vegetable or a fruit, maybe one or two in a day, but that might not suffice at that age because micronutrient requirement increases as you age. And one more thing that you had mentioned is protein intake should be more, right? It's because of the muscle yes. loss, the protein intake should be also increased during this age. So maybe specific nutritional uh, dietary needs are important as you as you go through uh, the menopause transition and after menopause. Yeah, because yeah. otherwise also no, we I... Indians, we lag behind in the protein intake. It's more, more of the carbohydrate-rich uh, society. So the protein portion is like a pickle. So carbohydrate portion is too big for the body to metabolize it. So that is something, uh, area which we need to focus on. Also have, um, I hope that answered your question, Anu. Um, we yes, also the, have... the micronutrient part, yes, thank you. Great. So another question we had in the chat, uh, for women 70 and above, anything special? Oh, I think you mentioned it, like more protein. So I think protein intake is definitely something. The other question is, um, hi, can intermittent fasting help manage fat accumulation around the abdomen that happens in perimenopause? So I think intermittent fasting, everybody is talking about it now. So what's your take on it? The intermittent fasting is a way of autopsy of the cells, meaning there are uh, the cells are broken down. So the unwanted cells, the thing is broken down when you're not providing food for a longer time. So the body doesn't work like on specific regions of fat reduction. So the fat might go from your arms, from your thighs, from your legs. And the last thing is from the abdomen. So intermittent fasting alone will not reduce your abdominal gain. So the mechanism is when you're doing this intermittent fasting, your overall intake of your food goes down. So your total calorie intake goes down. And that is how it helps in reducing your uh, fat percentage, provided it is done in a systematic scientific manner. See, there are people I have seen who are like fasting for 12 to 14 hours but they're eating all the junk in that eight hours of window period. So that is not going to help you in any way. So that eight hours period is a way for, pro, a way for providing a right nutrition to your body so that it can take care of your needs for the rest 12 to 16 hours whenever you are fasting. So, and for that matter, any single methodology will not help in reducing your fat percentage. So you may be surrounded with all the miracle drinks and uh, strategies around which will help you to, which claim that you can reduce your weight within a week, within 10 days, 15 days. But it it requires self-discipline on the part of the uh, person as to how he is approaching it. So there is no one short approach to address this abdominal fat issue. I know it's a concern for everyone, So even for ladies who have gone C-section, so that's a major bail. So even I have undergone this. So I I do have abdominal fat, but it's controlled. So I don't say I have a flat uh, tummy, but it it requires a lot of uh, effort on on our part to control it. 
because stress is something which comes anytime, anywhere. So all these things need to be managed for a flat return. And I think there's also some level of acceptance that is uh, needed for, you know, your aging body. And of course, you can be fit and develop muscle and, you know, you look a certain way. But I think there also needs to be some acceptance about, you know, aging and embracing that whole part. And that is what also Miara is about. So not stressing on superfoods or a miracle drink, but just the, as you said, the holistic concept of dealing with one's health certain so, aspects we need to agree and accept and just move ahead so there's no point in cribbing or complaining about it so whatever means we are able to do we should definitely try to do that um does anybody yes please uh priya if you, you want to unmute uh you you're welcome to unmute and ask your question hi uh, I'm Priya here. I had a question uh, with respect to the thyroid. Uh, I have I've had like subclinical hyperthyroidism since like college days, which means my TSH is like almost undetectable or low. But my FT3, F hyperthyroidism does not cause any problem as such if the levels are marginal or within the uh, acceptable range. So you don't have to worry too much about it. But going forward, like as you're saying about 40 or 50, you may have a risk of catching certain bone uh, problems or muscle issues. So for that, focus on trying a balanced diet and controlling your iodine-rich foods. So thyroid is something related to your iodine thing. So you need to keep a tab on the iodine content of the foods, what you, what you are consuming on a regular basis, coupled with regular exercise. So again, hyperthyroidism, there is a lot of high metabolic rate in the body. So even if you are eating like too much also, you will be lean and uh, slim as compared to a uh, hypothyroid patient. So you don't have to worry so much about it. So control it. I mean, don't get over obsessed. That is what I'm trying to tell you. So focus on your diet and your activity part and manage your stress. So these are something which is within your control. So beyond that, if the levels go high, go haywire, that is something which medications can take care of. But don't stress too much about what is going to happen tomorrow. By spoiling, by focusing, try to focus on what is uh, doable today. That is what I would uh, suggest you. Right. Thank you. So you mean when you say, uh, uh, so iodized salt is the only way that we get that recommended uh, intake. Is that right? Um, so, because I, see, there is no, a iodized, iodized salt is one source of iodine. There are natural iodine which is present in your uh, foods. So we need to make a food data sheet. We, you need to record your food for maybe three, four days or seven days. And just try to see where is that that iodine part is going extra inside your uh, diet. Is there something which you're taking extra, any food? So we need to monitor that. And then only we'll be able to uh, guide you further on this uh, part. Yeah. So so otherwise, you don't have to worry too much. That is what I want to say. Because as your levels are almost like within the range and you're not on medications, so focusing on a diet, exercise, and stress management should be able to help you. So Priya, I would you. recommend that you get in touch with us and then we can uh, work from there. So great. Thank you. But I just wanted to, uh, there was one, I, if anybody else has an, any other question, please feel free to put it in the chat. This is your chance to ask Saumya. But uh, Samia also is a diabetes educator and she's she's got a lot of experience in this area. and and diabetes um is it an issue kind of related to menopause in that sense and can it be avoided let's say through the right diet i know this is a kind of loaded question for you but um diet and diabetes that would be the the question really uh see again diabetes is a disorder meaning there is this order there is no order inside the body it's a metabolic disorder so what we need to understand is if we want to reverse it, 
if we want to prevent it, we need to bring that order back inside in our life. Okay. So what happens is diabetes is not a overnight disorder that you eat something the last night or you get it within 10, 15 days. It's a chronic disorder which starts very early in life. And the main problem with diabetes is it goes undetected because it is symptomless in the initial stages. There have been people whom I have seen like up to seven to 10 years, they're still not, they were not even aware that they had diabetes because there were no classic symptoms. What people associate is like, you need to have too much of uh, hunger, too much of uh, thirst and too much of urination for the classic diabetes to get uh, diagnosed or it is sometimes a random blood test that uh, helps you in detecting that you have diabetes. So diabetes is definitely is preventable. Again, focusing on your weight. Weight is the biggest factor in causing many wet metabolic disorder because the body is in a stressful state when your weight is increasing. It has to work more. So all its natural activities are diverted to compensate that excess weight inside your body. It puts a pressure on your uh, bone. It puts a pressure on your internal activities. So if you know, if you realize that your weight is going on an upward scale, the first and foremost thing is to try to reduce them. And as I said, become more mobile. So mobile in the sense, not the gadget, but you should be moving more. So that mobile thing has to be inside the with the with your arms and legs, not the sitting gadget. And definitely focusing on your food part. See, it's not only what you eat, how much you eat, the way you eat, that also plays a very important uh, role. So you might agree with me, like we have been eating more than what we have been eating compared to last 10 to 20 years. But still the nutritional status of people is degrading day by day. So that means the choice of food is not proper and you are eating it in a wrong way, eating it in a very hurried fashion or a stressful state. So the body is not able to absorb it. When, when are you giving it a chance to absorb? So you are like eating all the time. So when will the body take time to absorb it? So these are certain crucial things which you need to understand like before you embark on your health transformation journey. So that is why people find it difficult to follow a diet. So diet doesn't mean that you uh, seclude uh, certain food groups and then focus on eating only these food groups. It is all about balance. So we have festivals, we have functions everywhere throughout the year. So it's not like he, I'll be like a saint and not eat anything. So it all depends on how much you are eating. The portion control plays a very important role in a diabetic diet. So you can't claim that I've been eating this much, so I'll eat this much. No, that, that mentality should definitely be changed when you are trying to control your sugars. That uh, makes sense, absolutely. So this is uh, another chance if anybody else wants to ask a question. Uh, any comments on the link between increasing insulin resistance around menopause? Can diet and lifestyle minimize this effect? Definitely. That is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, Everything what... can be controlled. So insulin resistance, your PCOS, thyroid, diabetes, everything is related to your hormones. Yeah. Okay. So focus on your food, focus on your activity. Definitely, if you take the right steps at the right age, most of these diseases are reversible or preventable, I would rather say. So lifestyle disorders can be managed with the modification in the diet, in the lifestyle and not with the medicines per se. Because again, we need that convenience. Okay, I'm taking so many tablets, so it, it should get controlled. No, it is a lifestyle disorder. So it warrants that you make changes in your lifestyle along with your medication, supplements, whichever is recommended to you. But again, pre-planning your uh, daily meals. So what happens is, again, due to shortage of time, we are like always on the go. We tend to eat what is available rather than plan and eat. So in the process, we tend to miss out on the various important crucial nutrients which are required by the body and more so for the women. 
so there is a adage that uh, you should eat a breakfast like a king and uh, pauper and all the same uh, old proverb but again considering the stressful hectic lifestyle what we are leading today it all depends ultimately how much of that pool is actually going inside so whether you are eating more in the morning or afternoon doesn't make so much of sense as to how much you are eating and what are your next activities like if i'm eating a heavy dinner and if i'm going to sleep within an half an hour that is going to turn into fat okay so if you are eating like a heavy thing maybe before 6 or 7 and you are going to sleep by 10 to 11 that's perfectly okay so you need to plan it that is what is the main crux of the uh, thing that most of us uh, feel lag behind while planning the meals so that could be because of the family issues i mean there are many members in the family it is difficult to cater to different needs so women tend to eat whatever is available so there are very few ladies who would cook for themselves so as far as i know and even if you would agree so it is mostly the food which is available we try to adjust within that so we need to actually plan so which is good for the entire family as well so that you know that you are on the right track i hope that answered your question kritika uh, are there any more questions um from the I audience i have one yeah Gayatri has a question as well let me just ask this one it's actually in continuation of um, some of the things that you spoke earlier samia about diabetes and uh, insulin resistance um you know a lot of women around this age group of menopause transition and menopause or perhaps even perimenopause have cravings at different uh, uh, times now i'm not just talking about cravings around the menstrual cycle but let's say a, a menopause transition or even a post menopause woman uh, there something seems to be a lot of cravings um is it related to insulin um, or is there something else that we need to look at Um, and how do we manage this see cravings is basically a body's way of telling you that it is lagging something so you need to provide certain things which it can take care of so cravings is a body signal saying that you are deficient in certain nutrients and most of the cravings are because of magnesium deficiency in the diet so magnesium see whenever you have your cravings it is what is the first thing that you resort to chocolates right so, so that is a very good source of junk junk food so, chocolates and then junk yeah it's it's junk food so anything which which soothes our brain so that is something which we go to during our uh, what do you call when we are stressed out yeah. or when we have that extensive uh, cravings inside our body so right. that basically signals that somewhere your magnesium is low so maybe you can try eating nuts or dry fruits instead of your chocolate so in that process you are getting your nutrients as well and you are controlling your cravings as well and for that again you should know when is that peak time that when that cravings is going to give you a shot see for some people it might be in the evening at 5 to 6 for some people it may be in the midnight they just go to the fridge and just grab whatever is available there and then they have that vicious cycle going on every day so that is something which you need to uh, be aware of so awareness is something which is very important apart from the dietary part so magnesium is mostly the thing which causes cravings in many for those of you part that was the insight for you for those of you part of the community we've also put a, a or you can check out on our website we've put a food log and i think samia stressed this many times it's good to log your food to kind of also figure out what nutritional gaps what like this peak timing where you are uh, you know have your craving so it's a good idea to maybe start on a food log uh, if you're not already doing it so that's uh, that's actually a good point um, there's also a question when we say planning a meal what point should we take uh, should we take care of 
so basically planning a meal involves your entire family's preferences the health conditions the age groups which are surrounded with because as i said it is practically impossible to plan a meal for a single person so you need to consider the entire family if you are you are staying in a uh, family setup so the thing is what choice of carbohydrates you are using whether it is a easily digestible one or is it something which is going to sustain your hunger for a longer time like there are people who eat their breakfast by 8 9 but till 2 3 o'clock they don't have anything in between so then planning a complex carbohydrate which gives you that satiety that fullness is very important second the protein source so whether you are taking it from an animal source or whether you are getting it from a plant source or whether you are taking a supplement so that needs to be taken into account and third your fats so we are mostly concerned with the visible fats but there are certain foods i mean practically every food has fat content in it but that is not something which you need to keep calculating but looking at the food stuff itself you should know that this fat is going to contain fat so i need to control my fat the visible fat which i'm using for the other uh, recipes of the diet like for instance we know that dairy products or cheese or nuts are inherently rich in fats so while you are using that such food so make use of some steamed food or shallow fried food or uh, sauteed food that way you are balancing all the nutrients and your satiety is also taken care of so this is something which needs to be trained but i'm just telling you in brief so it's a process so once you get along once you understand where you are going wrong once you become aware of the family's preferences your preferences so everything will uh, fall in place so that planning a meal becomes secondary to you so you don't have to stress too much about it so what to eat every time what 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 super food should i order so all those things can be taken care of <laughs> great i think that was a good answer uh, to this and kind of also wraps up what um Uh, all the questions and things that we wanted to say but samya do you have any parting words for our audience before uh, we talk about the next thing the next exciting thing coming up yeah okay so my only message to you all is take care of your health it is not something very difficult to manage but again you need to prioritize it try to delegate try to get rid of the responsibilities as you grow up because we ladies tend to put on everything on our heads and then try to side side stream our health so that is something which you need to uh, follow diligently in your everyday life and don't get too much stressed about a disorder or a disease try to understand the pillars what i have told you in the beginning the breathing techniques your movements and the hydration part because everything surrounds around this all your diet therapy will fail if your pillars are not strong so this is something i would give as a take away message before starting anything focus on these three pillars and then start your health transformation journey so if you want to remember it as a acronym bhm breathing uh, hydration breathing and movement is something which you need to start off before you uh, actually start your dietary uh, therapy in the reversal or preventing your uh, disorders in the future great i think that's a great point for those of you who don't know about us uh, please uh, check out our website we are uh, miara a online health platform for women uh, transitioning into midlife and beyond that being said we don't discriminate everybody is welcome to join our community we have a very commun- open community uh, a non judgmental space where you can join the links are in the chat so would be really happy to interact with all of you and thank you so much saumya i think this was i think uh, everybody got something uh, out of it for sure um i know i did i also learned a few new things today so thank you so much um yeah and uh, yeah look forward to more such conversations with you and with the miara community oh thanks a lot and a big congratulations to the miara team for uh, bringing out this uh, session 
and their bigger vision so i hope you reach out to many more people and spread awareness of the same so that more uh, women come out and speak out and take care of their take charge of their health on a personal note so thank you so much thank you thanks a lot